This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we're rolling the Wayback Machine over 100 years with a visit to the vintage and golden aircraft of the past. There's no time to lose, so let's crank them up. This is the story of the cavalry of the air, the daring young men in the flying machines who were the eyes of the army. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, former U.S. Air Force F-16 pilot, Trevor Boswell. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Boat, and it's been a minute since we've done a true Warbird episode here on the podcast, so we're back at it. And I thought it'd be fun to go to the extreme of what we consider warbirds. So we've got a great interview lined up for you today on a great organization called Cole Palin's Old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. And as a fun little nod to the aircraft of the era, we titled today's show, Those Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines, from the movie by the same name, upon the recommendation of Patreon subscriber Sven Weber. And Sven, we obviously love the idea, so thank you for the assist. Now, as for announcements this week, there's not too much to discuss. I'm still waiting on my airline training to be scheduled, and since that hasn't happened, uh, it hasn't stopped me from getting one of our April episodes recorded and preparing for a few others between now and then. And we've got some real fun stuff heading your way in the coming months, so definitely stay tuned. Last night, I participated in a Zoom call with some Air Force ROTC cadets from my alma mater at Detachment 105 and its network of schools. And I had a great time answering all their questions and talking Air Force career stuff with them. And it really was a neat experience getting to do that. But on the flip side, it also makes you feel pretty old. Now, it's been 18 years since I was a student. Man, the time has absolutely flown by. It's been a blast and I appreciated the invite. But man, enough feeling old. Let's jump into the old mailbag and see what we've got. And our first item is an email from Gilbert Madrid, who writes in, Finally got around to listening to the end of your recap, and I'm fascinated by how much of the show has grown and rooted itself in its various forms. Now, when talking about IFEs or in-flight emergencies, Boat mentioned the peanut gauge on the F-16, or for those that were uh, listening, it was the oil pressure gauge. And I got curious about the actual cost as you guys were talking about it. And so while checking out new parts for the cockpit, I had the parts guy look up the cost of the gauge. And so let Boat know on my behalf that the peanut gauge cost the taxpayer $914.47, another drop in the bucket. And as a side note, a surprisingly cheap comparison to the master caution button, which uh, that whole assembly is nearly $9,000. Hope your year is off to a great start. Looking forward to what BBR Productions will bring this year and take care. Well, Gilbert, thanks so much for that. And thanks for writing in. Yeah, I said it was like 12 cents or something crazy. It clearly is not that. So thanks for doing the research on my behalf. And I guess we can clear up that for for all the Viper pilots out there. But I guess if it does cost that much, we'll stop to start trusting that thing a bit more because uh, $914 seems like a fairly sizable increase. You know, we don't really distrust the gauge, but it is pretty funny that something as important as the oil system on a single engine fighter doesn't have more redundancy built in, or at least it didn't when it was first designed. And the master caution assembly being $9,000 That is crazy, but I know we talk about golden toilets and whatever that the federal government likes to spend their money on. So I guess it is connected to basically every major system, at least in the aircraft, and you do need to engineer that thing pretty well. So I guess we can trust that oil system gauge a little bit better for that. And Gilbert, we appreciate all of our Patreon subscribers, and you have been with us for over three and a half years. So we are so thankful that uh, you're here and you've stuck with us all this way. We look forward to uh, what the year has to bring and uh, you coming along with, with us. So thanks for being part of it. All right, now switching over to an email from Don Childs. And he's responding to the listener question from Owen in the last episode, episode 130 on flight surgeons, regarding which service to join and whether it's the Navy or the Air Force or anything else, frankly. And so his response is, great episode. Wanted to add a comment to the answer to the question about Air Force or Navy. And my son went through the same thing. And ultimately, he chose the Air Force because his dream was to be a military aviator and he was hoping for fighters. The deciding factor was simply that he stood a better chance of being a pilot in the Air Force because there are exponentially more aircraft and aircraft types. He didn't end up getting fighters and flies the Viper now, but would have been happy with a C-17 as long as he was flying. So Don, thanks so much for writing in with your son's perspective, and I think it's a great one to have. And Jello gave his answer in the last episode, which I thought was spot on and really the right way to view the services and how to navigate coming up with your personal perspective on which service to join. And I guess my two cents, if you all want it, is that 
each branch of the military offers its pros and cons, kind of like Jello alluded to. And there are definitely some stigmas attached with each of them. Like, hey, get stuck on a ship for six more months, uh, join the Navy or fly a desk, join the Air Force. If you're going to go fly helicopters in the Army, play in the mud. There's so much more than that, though, to each of the services. And so it does really pay dividends to do your due diligence by finding a mentor. Like Jello said, go visit bases if you have the ability to do so, or at least go talk to people at air shows as they are typically standing by their airframes or their equipment and really try to get a really good understanding of what the branch of that service is all about. Because at the bottom line, the needs of the service is going to uh, dictate what you are going to go do. And so even if you don't get the exact job you want, the risk of joining the military is that you're still going to be part of the service. And if they don't need fighter pilots, you're going to get something else that you may not have wanted when you first went in. But at the end of it, when you look back, more likely than not, you're going to love your experience with it. So, you know, it's a risk reward system, but I think uh, overall, everything is great when you uh, are able to look back on it from a, a good perspective like that. But definitely do your homework up front for sure. So Don, thanks for uh, writing in. All right. Our next email comes from Paul Hammer and he asks, I was wondering why asthma is a disqualifying condition or at least mild asthma is for the uh, Royal Australian Air Force. And interesting, you need to get tested for the uh, Australian Antarctic Division too, as it doesn't seem to stop Olympians or aces like Oswald Belke from a very high performing career. Is it solely due to the OBOGs drawing the lung? I thought it worked the same as oxygen concentrators and airline pressurization systems, which don't usually cause asthma attacks with well-managed mild asthma, or is it a logistics issue providing asthma puffers whilst deployed? All right. So Paul, the short answer is it depends. And frankly, there's no, I don't think one right answer. And that answer may change over time. And I think we've probably said something to that effect on a previous uh, listener question or two that we've responded to. And so fundamentally, each service has disqualifying conditions based on how they view that situation. And with asthma, like anything, there's a risk that the service is going to assume if they allow you to fly with it, or even if you just allow you to participate in military service, doesn't even have to be in an aircraft. If they have a large pool of candidates, and this is kind of just a general way to think about that answer. If they have a large pool of candidates, but only a few slots, they may restrict the candidate pool to those that don't have the ailment because they can afford to do so. But ultimately, I'd love to say that that's the 100% answer, but it's definitely not. And so I'd probably rather refer you to a flight surgeon or a medical professional with specific regards to asthma or any other ailment that you might be suffering from because the rationale isn't always known to the layperson. They'd be a much better resource for finding that information out so that you don't put yourself in a situation where you're denied military service because of an ailment that you have. Asthma is a very common disqualifying ailment, and it could be for various reasons uh, across the board. So, Paul, if you're trying to get in the military, best of luck to you, and I hope that uh, you're able to uh, live that dream when the time comes. All right, and our last email for the day comes from David Williams, and he writes in, I have enjoyed the Fighter Pilot podcast from the beginning and always look forward to the new episode. Having not gotten to live the fighter pilot life, but always having had an interest in military aviation, I particularly enjoy the sea stories and the little nuggets of information that are not necessarily known or thought of. I'd like to correlate it to NASCAR. Without the little behind-the-scenes technical information, it is just a bunch of cars turning left. My question comes from the last episode on flight surgeons. Various hazards were mentioned, and in light of some recent studies about cancer and pilots, it made me wonder. Do military pilots wear any sort of dosimeters to record radiation exposure from sun or radar? Keep up the great work. So David, a straightforward question deserves a straightforward answer. And so I will say no, but I can't answer that with any certainty. I have to make some assumptions in all of this. And I have to assume that there are pilots that are currently, or at least have in the past, gone through evaluations and studies that did wear the metering systems to evaluate exposure levels while flying. I know that there was an OBOGS issue a few years back with the F-22 and the F-35 where their pilots would wear an O2 sensor, not related to the specific question that you asked, but there are you know sensor capabilities that pilots can wear in the cockpit. But that being said, specific to cancer and radiation levels, no, I have not heard of one of those studies, but I again, I have to assume that they do or have that opportunity. But when it comes to uh, right now, specifically on a day-to-day basis, the average pilot is definitely not wearing something like that. But maybe they should. 
frankly, food for thought. And uh, you bring up a great point on that respect. Well, that will do it for questions today. And there were some great ones for sure. So please keep sending them in and we'll do our best to get an answer for you as soon as we are able. But for now, we're off to the interview and a blast from the way, way past, if you will. So with that, enjoy, and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back, everyone, to the second year of the Warbird series. Now, over the last year, we've covered some of the more well-known Warbirds, like the P-51 and the P-38, and maybe some even of the lesser-known Warbirds, but just as important, like the Hawker Hurricane and the B-24 Liberator. But today, I am very excited because we're not only talking Warbirds, we're talking World War I Warbirds, or as some call them, vintage aircraft. Now, these aircraft are very rare, and the list of places, though, that you can see one in flyable condition is even more so. So when I heard from listener Jeff C. about an operation that restores these aircraft and actually flies them, I knew I had to jump on it. So here we are, transporting ourselves back over 100 years to World War I, and our focus today, Cole Palin's old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. And so to discuss the incredible piece of living history that is the aerodrome and the aircraft of the era in the collection is the aerodrome's general manager, Mr. Stu Somerville. Stu, welcome to the Fighter Pile Podcast. I'm delighted to be here, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you for tracking me down and looking me up. I really appreciate it. Well, you know, as I always say, I always like to grab uh, listener inputs and get the feedback from them. And so when Jeff mentioned that you guys existed, I immediately went over to the website and started scrolling through all of the amazing aircraft that you guys have in your collection. And it's not just aircraft, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about some of the other things in there, but specifically those aircraft of the area. And let's just jump into it because I'm very excited to hear about what these things are, how you guys got a hold of them, and just kind of what the operation is all about. So let's learn a little bit about you up front. Like I said, you're the general manager for the aerodrome. How did you get your start? How did you get to the aerodrome itself? That's a great question. I get asked that almost every day. <laughs> My first visit here was as a, um, an 11 year old boy. I came here with my father who brought me to an air show and my father worked at IBM. He was an engineer. He was friends with some of the people that founded the Rhinebeck Aerodrome. So my dad would bring me here whenever he would come to participate in the hangar talk that went on here. And I was volunteering since I was a very young boy. I left to go to college and get a real job. And I had a 23-year teaching career where I was a secondary school English teacher. I had a wonderful career, but you know how things go. You kind of burn out. You kind of get tired of what you're doing. And lo and behold, this job opened up. I applied for it. And I like to think in my heart of hearts that it was a symbiotic thing between the uh, board of trustees here at the aerodrome and myself. And I was lucky enough to get the job about four years ago. And I uh, don't intend on going anywhere, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. That's great. Well, it's amazing that you find yourself in these situations, various places around the world when it comes to job opportunities, and everything like that. So it sounds yeah. like, you know, a match made in heaven. Well, you know, it's not only that for me personally, but it is an absolute privilege to be here in the, on the hollowed grounds of the Rhinebeck Aerodrome that has been around since the late 1950s. And it is indeed a privilege to anybody that I go back to that old adage, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And that is certainly the case here. I come to work every day and I can Maybe some days I'll be wrenching on a Model T. Yeah. Some days I'll be involved in fundraising. Some days I'll be helping our A&P mechanics on a rotary engine. It's just a match made in heaven. I have trouble going home at night. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm assuming you're married, but I'm sure your wife, it's a love-hate relationship. Well, you know, there, there's a story to that too, but it doesn't pertain to your objective here. So uh. <laughs> it's all good. Like I said, I'm very excited to learn about what old Rhinebeck has to offer and on all the aircraft that we have to discuss in the collection. So let's jump into it. You talked about the aerodrome starting in the 1950s. Can you give me a little bit more about why first it's called old Rhinebeck and who started it and where you all are located, all the basic stuff? Yeah, the aerodrome was started by a gentleman by the name of Cole Palin who was a young boy, was an aviation enthusiast. He built models, and he dreamed of being a pilot and of flying. He loved especially the vintage aircraft. Um, he was drafted into the Second World War 
and he uh, got into the Second World War around the time of the Battle of the Bulge, right. right about the end of the war. He saw a little bit of action. He saw enough of it to make him wish he wasn't there. The war ended, and subsequently he came back to the States. He attended the Roosevelt School of Aviation on Long Island. Your listeners will recognize that name, the History of Aviation Buffs, as the site where Lindbergh actually took off for his epic transatlantic flight. So Mr. Palin went to uh, the Roosevelt School of Aviation, and in one year, he got his pilot's license, and he got, I don't know if it was referred to as the AMP, the Airframe and Power Plant License, but he got the equivalent of that in one year. Lo and behold, the Roosevelt School of Aviation was sold to make room for the shopping mall that there is there today. Way in the back of the property of the Roosevelt School of Aviation was a Quonset hut where they stored the mowing equipment, the grading equipment, the uh, equipment they used to uh, keep the grounds up to snuff on the airfield. But way tucked in the back of that Quonset hut was a collection of six antique airplanes. They were going up for auction. Mr. Palin bid his life savings, which was around $2,000 at the time, and lo and behold, he won this auction. He had one month to get them off of uh, Long Island. One by one, he dragged those airplanes up here to Dutchess County, about 100 miles north of New York City. He put them on his parents' chicken farm in a small town called Red Oaks Mill, which is not far from here. And one by one, he dragged them up. He got a couple of them going, but he didn't have a permanent place to keep them. This property where we are today, where the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome is today, at the time was going up for sale. It was an abandoned farm. Nobody wanted this property because there was an unsolved murder on this property. And Mr. Palin got this old abandoned farm I'm not going to say cheaply, but certainly under market value. One at a time, he dragged these old airplanes here, threw up a couple of, I hate to call them hangars, but they were basically buildings to keep the aircraft in. And he got a couple of the airplanes flying. After a while, some of the locals would see some of these antique airplanes flying. And this is 1958, this property he started flying here. And people would start to come out of an interest. They saw the antique airplanes flying, and they basically wanted to find out where they came home to roost at night. And slowly, people started to come. And that's where he started to amass this, what we know today as a small army of people that come here and volunteer. But he had no intention of putting on formal air shows. He may have been a little naive in thinking that he just was going to repair and fly these old airplanes for his own enjoyment. Slowly, he started putting on air shows once a month. He didn't charge admission, but what he would do is put a silk top hat on one of his antique cars, and people would throw money in out of appreciation to help him keep his collection going. And that went okay for a couple of years. And I hate to call them air shows. They're more like aerial demonstrations of of the aircraft. Then in 1962, 1963, an amazing thing happens. And that is the Charles Schultz Peanuts comic strip came out featuring Snoopy and the Red Baron. Interest in the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome exploded. People started coming here in waves. Right about then, that's when Mr. Palin went to the Saturday-Sunday air show format that we know today. The uh, Aerodrome got another boost in 1970. We were the feature in the National Geographic, the October 1970 issue of National Geographic. That helped launch the aerodrome even further in the stratosphere, and we haven't looked back since. There have been some ups and downs, not the least was last year with the COVID-19 pandemic. The gas crisis of the 1970s hurt us pretty hard, but I'm happy to say that we are here. We are alive and well and performing air shows every Saturday and Sunday from this year. It's June 18th until October 16th. Amazing. That's awesome. If anybody's interested, we have about 60, 75 airplanes in the collection. 
depending on what you folks want to call an airplane, because to us, a basket of parts is an airplane. It's just not put together yet. <laughs> we maintain anywhere from 12 to 15 of those aircraft in airworthy status to perform in the air shows. Also, some of our pilots have antique airplanes of their own, and they are also featured in the air shows also. Very cool. So yeah, that was one of my next questions was, how many are there in the inventory? And then how many were there that are flyable? Does the aerodrome, and I'm just going to refer to the lengthy title of sure. this majestic place as the aerodrome, but how many of the aircraft does the aerodrome own or are there other owners of the aircraft that are part of the collection? You know, I'm going to say about 95% are owned by the aerodrome. Okay. Anywhere from three or four, maybe five airplanes are owned by uh, some of our line pilots. We use them in the air shows as well, but the majority of the uh, aircraft are owned by the aerodrome. Awesome. Yeah, I think the next logical question is, where do they come from? How do you guys get your hands on these aircraft? And you've clearly been around for a while. So how many did you start out with? And then, you know, you've gotten to your current state, but how do you acquire these things? That's a fair question. Mr. Palin started off with six antique airplanes that he got from Roosevelt Field. Over the years, he purchased some aircraft of interest that he literally went to trade a plane sometimes and, sure. and found some of the stuff by that venue. I don't know how he'd react to uh, the internet and everything today, but nonetheless, I should point out that a good many of our aircraft are original, but we do not fly them. Okay. Their value is such that, you know, we like to keep some of them on static display in our museum. Some of them are reproduction airplanes, as accurate as we uh, can build them, and they are powered by original engines, however. Okay. Not a lot of the old stuff comes up these days. We are constantly open to any uh, donations that might want to come down the pike. If there's an aircraft that is absolutely historically significant, we may ask the Board of Trustees to purchase the airplane. That's very rare, but it does happen from time to time. And looking through the list of aircraft, you know, you've got Aircraft from the United States, you've got aircraft from France, yeah. some German aircraft, mm -hmm. some uh, British aircraft. Mm -hmm. In your estimation, what is the most unique aircraft that you all have in your collection? Well, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like asking someone what their favorite Beatles song is. Sure. It's really hard to do. What's today? Today is Friday. All right, today I'm gonna <laughs> say we have the Albury Pigeon Fraser in our collection. Now that is about, I would be shocked if any of your listeners or even yourself even heard of this airplane. This was the first contribution of the United States to a frontline fighter to the First World War. As you know, that when war breaks out in Europe, there's not a lot of American designs that make their way to Europe and the First World War until 1917, 1918. The reason being the Wright brothers were embattled in this patent dispute with a fellow by the name of Glenn Curtis, oh. because the Wright brothers were claiming that they invented flight, they invented the airplane, but somebody else came up with the idea of ailerons. And the Wright brothers said, no, 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 I'm oversimplifying this. Sure. There's a lot of fabulous scholarship out about it. But there was a block on anybody designing, building, and selling their airplanes in the United States. That doesn't get thrown out of court until about 19, 1916, 1917, where President Wilson is under such a strong, powerful lobby in Washington to help our allies. The courts finally threw the argument out, and these gates open, so to speak. For other manufacturers to create aircraft and exactly and, yeah. and that's why you don't see american designed airplanes in the first world war however the first one was the albury pigeon fraser it was a terrible designed airplane <laughs> the entire tail section allow me to use the spirit of st louis here sure the tail section as you know might have a rudder or elevators in the back. Well, on the Albury Pigeon Fraser, from about three quarters back on the fuselage, the entire tail section articulated. 
Ah. I think there were only three or four built. Ours is a, one of the prototypes, and more than one pilot was killed testing to fly the airplane, but we have one of them there. So the, today on Friday, January 14th, that is what I think is the most uh, unique airplane. Others in the collection, certainly, one of the cool things about being here and being a gearhead and a mechanic at the same time is seeing the progression of the technology. We go all the way back to our 1909 Blario, which is the second oldest airplane flying in the world today, our Blario 11, and uh, has wing warping technology. Each one of the pioneers has its own flight characteristics, its own flight controls. Our Hanriel monoplane, the pilot has the... Um, pitch control in one hand, he has the roll control in the other, and he operates the rudder with his feet. And just to see the progression of that technology is quite stunning. And how we got to where the airplane is today, it's a remarkable thing. Yeah. I've been fortunate enough to hear plenty about World War II era aircraft. And you know, we're talking, if you're starting with the Blair 11, you know, like you said, 1909 was when that came into existence. And it's showing here a top speed of 47 miles an hour. Yeah. Only weighs 480 pounds. Yeah. It's got a 25 foot wingspan. And then you look however many years that is, what, 20 some odd years forward, you're talking hundreds of miles an hour. Sure. Not a, like the weight of aircraft today, but definitely a lot more weight associated with that. Oh, absolutely. A ton more horsepower associated with aircraft. So you can see, obviously, how rapid that advancement in technology has happened. You mentioned the technology advancement. Uh, you know, I mentioned from the pioneer era, yeah. which is the time from 1903 when the Wright brothers fly right up to the 1918 and First World War. World War II had its share of progression of technology as well. And I know I'm getting off song here, <laughs> but that first generation uh, Messerschmitt 262, that's a remarkable and fascinating transformation. It definitely is. Uh, that era of itself. And we haven't covered it yet, so we're not going to spoil anything so far. But yeah, no, it, you are very correct in that respect. And you mentioned the Blario. One, I have to throw this in there. One of the pilots that flies our uh, Blario says, you don't really fly the Blario. It's more like uncontrolled levitation. <laughs> <laughs> the wing warping technology at 35 miles an hour is not very effective. You're often at the mercy of the wisp of the wind. But, you know, that's what it's all about here. We are all about the origins of flight and reliving that experience. Yeah, that's amazing. Like you said, you primarily use the original engines, even yes. in, the, in the reproduction yeah. versions. How does that process work when it comes to the care and feeding of that 100 plus year old piece of equipment? That's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. The cold hard facts are that the stuff is disappearing. Okay. Whenever we see a rotary engine on the marketplace and we have people that are monitoring that situation, if it's certainly serviceable, we'll do everything we can to either get that donated to the collection or we will make a purchase or barter something. Keep in mind that we are a 501c3 we're a not-for-profit organization, and there are certain rules and regulations, you know, handed down by New York State that we have to abide by. We can't go buy and sell stuff willy-nilly, that's for sure. Okay. There's a process involved in it, and the ultimate decision rests on our board of trustees. But if there's something that we absolutely have to have, we will do it. What we do here is incredibly labor intensive. It is incredibly expensive and it is incredibly specialized. Finding the people who can work on a rotary engine or a radial engine these days is getting to be a chore in and of itself. Yeah, I can absolutely imagine that. A few months back, we interviewed one of the folks from the commemorative Air Force mm -hmm. and from my understanding, you guys do not fall under that category, but you fall in the same vein of an organization that is attempting to keep historic aircraft in the air. So first and foremost, you've talked about the foundation and uh, your board of directors. Who makes up that board of directors? You don't need to specify names, but who makes up that board of directors and how is your funding provided? Well, our board of trustees is a uh, collection of people who... They are local business people in the area. 
our president of the Board of Trustees. You can look him up. He's a wonderful man. He started here as a volunteer and he made his way into the presidency. One of our trustees grew up here. His father was the uh, chief mechanic here at the time, and he literally grew up in the backyard of the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. The board is actively pursuing the best people to sit on the board. Actually, now, fundraising becomes more and more important. So I'm not saying that we don't take airplane people onto the board now. Certainly, if somebody brought something to the table, we are starting to look into what particular talent that board member might bring to the overall operation of the museum. Sure. And it might not be, you know, an encyclopedic knowledge of airplanes or engines or something like that. It's just the nature of the beast to keep the aerodrome on solid ground for the next 50 years. Yeah. Our major source of income, of course, is the air shows. We uh, also provide biplane rides here, extremely popular. We fly rides seven days a week, usually seven days a week. They are done before and after every Saturday and Sunday air show, weather permitting. If folks want to fly during the week, they can give us a ring and book a ride Monday through Friday also. And what would they be flying in when they're doing those rides? Ah, they're flying in a D-25 new standard biplane. It's a rather, I'm not going to say odd, but it's not one of your more streamlined designs. All right. But the interesting thing is, and I really enjoy telling people this, that the D-25 new standard was designed to do one thing, and that is give people rides. It has a massive payload capability. We can fly four people plus a pilot in the D-25. And it is doing today what it was designed to do in 1929, and people absolutely love it. Sometimes they're a little apprehensive, you know, they really have the urge to go up and kick the tires or, you know, touch the airplane and make sure it's... But we have an almost impeccable safety record with it. That's fantastic. Yeah, there's a video clip to some folks riding it on the website and yeah they definitely look like they're having a great time and that is a unique setup for a biplane you know it really is there's very very few places in the world where you could do that wow yeah it's really popular so we talked about the funding i'm assuming you all accept donations i think i heard you mention that at some point as well absolutely where can folks find old rhinebeck so that they can go check out what you all have in Mm -hmm. the collection sign up for rides and uh, attend an air show All the information you need would be on our website. That would be www.oldrhinebeck.org. There's a portal there to make a donation, if you like. All the information you need to book a biplane ride, what the biplane rides are like, you know, what the requirements are and things like that. There's a drop box on it for the air shows. You can see what we do. Also, in events, we do, for the most part, enjoy groups coming here. Last year... We had oh, a vintage fire apparatus day here at the aerodrome. We had a Jeep day. We have Porsche 911 day and things like that. Unfortunately, this year, we won't be doing a lot of events because our events space is being uh, taken up by uh, well-needed construction. Ah. So that's a little sacrifice we have to make for one year only, but there will be some events on the website. Like a refurbishment kind of situation for the space? A badly needed one, and it's most welcome. Yeah, that's very good. Now, you did mention you had some of the board members that had been volunteers. Mm -hmm. Is that still an opportunity? Can people still come and volunteer their time? There's a place on the website where you can reach out to us if you are interested in volunteering. There's a process involved, of course, but I encourage anybody who would like to go on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, fantastic. What about education opportunities? Do you guys do outreach programs or school groups or anything like that? And what kind of programs do you guys offer? We love school groups here. We love giving tours of the facility. I do have a couple of A&P schools that book days well in advance to come here and show their students what we do. We are in the uh, infant stages of a youth program here where young people from around the local area can come here. They can actually work on an airplane. They'll learn some of the more artisan skills that it took to make an airplane back in the uh, 20s and 30s and so on. 
I've even had people at AMP schools give me a call and saying, you know, do you still cover airplanes there? Well, we sure do. Uh, and they were very interested in bringing their students here to learn how uh, airplanes were covered back in the day. It's a haven for young people who are interested in learning about aviation, its infancy, certainly its history, but the hands-on skills necessary to keep these birds going. Well, that's fantastic. Transitioning into what happens during an air show. So historically in the past, I'm sure people have seen movies and everything that have had what I would consider olden time air shows where it's some guy that has a biplane, grabs somebody, and they go do a little bit of a flyby in front of some grandstands and, yeah. and they come back and land. Is that kind of the makeup of what you guys do on air shows or what do those look like? Let's see. Are you familiar with the Marx Brothers? Yes. <laughs> and Cornball? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know what? We take great pride in the fact that when you cross our covered bridge and walk onto the property, you are literally walking back in time. We want very much for the people to experience an air show as it was in 1920. The buildings are uh, 1920 style. Certainly the airplanes are there. It's really a walk back in time. We have two shows. The Saturday show is the History of Flight show. We don't take the Pioneer aircraft up and fly them around the pattern, but we show folks that they do indeed fly and we hop the length of the runway with them. Very susceptible to wind conditions. We're very, very careful with the Pioneer aircraft. So the Saturday show is the History of Flight show. It features the Pioneer aircraft. We do a World War I teaser. We fly one of the World War I aircraft. We also do a rotary engine demonstration. Folks can't see that every day. And the rest of the aircraft are aircraft from what we call the Lindbergh era or the golden age of aviation, the 1920s up to about 1937, 1939, and things like that. And the Saturday show, I mentioned a little bit of cornball. We do do a, an escaped convict routine. We announce as soon as folks come in, there's an escaped convict in the area. And lo and behold, about halfway through the show, the convict disrupts the show, hops on an airplane, and I'm not going to give it away. And chaos ensues. Who knows yeah, what's going to happen? Yeah. And then we do a balloon bursting competition, which is very popular. The Saturday show is closes with an aerobatic routine. The Sunday show, we also hop the pioneers on the Sunday show, but the Sunday show is exclusively the World War I aircraft. And I'm proud to say that what we do on Sunday is exactly the same show that Mr. Palin put on way, way back in the day. And we're not actors. We're not professional actors by any stretch of the imagination. The acting is colorful. The comedy is very low. We're not going to win an Academy Award for anything. <laughs> but the funny thing is, whenever we try to refurbish the show or polish the show, or do something like that. My phone rings on Monday morning. How dare you? You know, we get that kind of thing. People love, love the brand of humor we put forward in the air shows. We have a hero who is a Sir Percy Goodfellow. His girlfriend, Trudy True Love, is the heroine of the show. And we also have the villainous Black Baron of Rhinebeck who uh, tries to steal the affections of Trudy True Love. There's a skit involved in that. But the good thing is the bad guy always loses and the good guy always wins. We do that because Mr. Palin was absolutely smitten with the uh, old... Uh, newsreels and comic routines like that. He absolutely loved them. He made his own. Also, we have in our archives uh, delightful home movies of Mr. Palin putting together skits and things like that. And that's part of the heritage that we recognize so deeply here that we're connected to. And we want to keep doing that. That's really great. What about your aircraft? Do you ever take them off site? Do they ever go to air shows at other locations or are they pretty strictly there? We're doing that less and less Okay. these days. There would be nothing we would enjoy more than taking three airplanes to Oshkosh, so to speak. Sure. Unfortunately, the liability insurance is 
remarkably high on our aircraft. And folks are welcome to come see us for sure. But I'm not going to say we don't do it or we wouldn't do it. But the situation would have to be the stars would have to line up in order for us to do it again. If an air show is local enough, we may consider flying an aircraft somewhere. But it would have to be, like I said, the perfect storm for us to do that. Yeah, I completely understand and can appreciate the challenges associated with you know financing, as you've kind of mentioned. Yeah, it's one thing to uh, disassemble an airplane and put it in a truck, take it to an air show and put the airplane back together. It's quite another thing to take an airworthy aircraft apart, reassemble it for flight. Mm-hmm. You know, there's quite a dichotomy there and a special attention needs to be given to that. That is a very good point. And obviously, if we lose one of these airplanes, it's not like we can just pull another one out of the yeah. out of the desert or someplace else. They're kind of one in a lifetime kind of, or aircraft, excuse me. All right. So, Stu, during our coordination process, you sent me some photos mm-hmm. of aircraft that we were trying to use for our cover photo on our Facebook page. And we ended up with this beautiful, amazing yellow aircraft. Can you tell me a little bit more about what the aircraft is that our folks have been uh, looking at for the past, uh, what is now, two weeks? That would be um, a training aircraft from the First World War. That is an Avro 504K used to train pilots for the First World War. That might have been their the very first step in their aircraft experience. It's certainly not a fighter plane. Okay. A very, very large wingspan. Very docile airplane to fly. Not terribly difficult. Powered by a rotary engine, which inherently brings its own challenges to an aircraft to learn how to fly. The Avro was purchased by Mr. Palin, I think, back in the 1970s. Don't quote me on that. But it appeared in a British movie. The name of the movie is about six miles long, and it's not coming to me right now. But it flew for many years here at the aerodrome. It had a little uh, engine failure and a little bit of mishap. So it is off-site now being restored. You'll notice that on the Avro 504K is that ski-looking apparatus in the front of the landing gear, and that's to prevent students from nosing the airplane over. But as I said, it's a very docile airplane to fly, very easy airplane to fly, a good way to uh, train fledgling pilots at the beginning. I should mention also that the average lifespan, and this is somewhat terrifying, the average lifespan of a World War I pilot from the time he finished flight school and got into a frontline squadron, he could expect to live for about six weeks. It was a very, very dangerous venture to get into. If the training didn't get you, first off, our SOP with Camel, and part of the tour that I give in the World War I Museum, you know, when we talk about the SOP with Camel, more young men were killed training to fly the SOP with Camel than actually died in combat. Wow. It's a scary venture. I'm happy to say that our pilots, we have some of the best pilots in the world here. Today, we actually have people that have more time flying a Fokker triplane than uh, the pilots of the First World War. We've been doing it for so long. Wow, that's really great. Well, you know, and, and as a, I guess Jello and I talked about it in our end of year wrap up for 2021, but, you know, we're talking about themed months that we're going into. And one of the other reasons that we threw the Avro 504K up there, other than the obvious, it's a beautiful aircraft to look at, is that for the month of February, we're planning a UK month. And so we're going to cover nothing but British aircraft. So we wanted to focus on, you know, a British aircraft as a lead in as well. But getting back to the aircraft itself, not just the Avro 504, you talked about the uh, SOP with Camel, and you have a Dolphin as well yeah. in the collection. As you guys have had all these aircraft in your collection, obviously, I'm sure you've had people from around the world come and visit. And mm-hmm. have you ever had any veterans of any of the wars that flew any of these aircraft come and stop by? Yes. We actually had a uh, couple of World War I pilots visit here. I wasn't here at the time, but you could tell it's a very emotional experience for them. We have had our share of celebrities here, for sure. Charles Lindbergh filmed part of his television program here pertaining to the history of flight. Uh, Not Charles Lindbergh, I'm sorry, Neil Armstrong. Okay. We would have loved to have Charles Lindbergh. (laughs) Sure, absolutely. We are very close with his uh, daughter, Reeve Lindbergh, is a very good friend of ours. 
They were very supportive when we were building and flying our uh, replica of Spirit of St. Louis here at Old Rhinebeck. But we've had movie stars visit. David Letterman was here last summer, oh, wow. which was a lot of fun. I didn't see him, and I'm still getting back at my staff for them not telling me that he was here. <laughs> That's neither here nor there. Captain Kangaroo was here also oh, wow. uh, filming an episode. Uh, you know, over the years, there's been a good many of them. We do get our fair share of World War II pilots also mm-hmm. that absolutely love to see the old stuff. We are absolutely devoted to our veterans, and we love to have them here. We do all that we can for them. Well, that's really great. And yeah, I can speak on behalf of them that uh, I know they appreciate the recognition. And I think for you know the listeners, I think we can all appreciate the time and devotion it takes to keep an operation like this going and the work that it you know, requires to um, keep these aircraft definitely up in the air. We would be nothing without our volunteers. We have about 80 volunteers that come from one time to the other. A lot of them will come and they'll just work the air shows. A smaller number of volunteers come here and they bring their specialized artisan skills to what we do here, which is absolutely critical to our operation here. Not a heck of a lot of people can let's say, poor Babbitt on a Model T for bearings and things like that. We have volunteers that do that or bring their skills to the car shop or the woodworkers that volunteer here that help us with making aircraft struts and things like that. It would be, I'm not going to say it'd be a sad operation, but we wouldn't be what we are today without them. Yeah, the world works on the kindness of others and uh, volunteerism is definitely in that category as well. Definitely, definitely. Well, Stu, you'd mentioned some celebrities. Uh, You mentioned a movie that uh, had a lengthy name. Anything else that uh, old Rhinebeck might be uh, known for in the world of celebrity? Any books that were written about it that our people can read about or pick up? You know what? Now that you I do have one here. I believe this book is out of print. It's The Great Plains by a fellow by the name of James Gilbert. Okay. There's a couple of chapters on uh, World War I. The chapter on Blario, you can see our Blario 11 in there. There's also a book that is also out of print. It's called The Old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. It's by Gordon Bainbridge. They're still out there on eBay and things like that. So okay. that can be found. There's also a video, a CD, that is available in our gift shop called Cole Palin's Flying Circus, which is a terrific compact chronicle of the history of the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome and gives a flavor of what we do here. Great. So there are some reference materials out there, yes. Fantastic. Well, I'll make sure that we add uh, those to the uh, show notes so that people can look to hunt down all that great stuff. And man, I'll tell you what, Stu, this has been a really great time for me. I've learned a ton about the operation and the organization. I look forward to visiting uh, at some point, hopefully later this year. You said the show season begins when again? The Static Museum opens May 1st. All right. And we are open seven days a week, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The air shows will start June 18th of this year, and the air shows run from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Saturday and Sunday. The last air show will be October 16th of this year, and the museum closes for the season on October 31st. Uh, Folks, if they want a biplane ride, can book a biplane ride during the week or come for the air show and enjoy a ride before or after the show. But if you do come early, they are very popular and the uh, biplane rides book up quickly. Definitely uh, sound like they would be a great time. And then, yeah, just to reiterate, uh, the Saturday show is not the same as the Sunday show. So That's definitely correct. you probably want to stay the whole weekend. So make a whole big weekend of it. Yeah, there are a great many things to do here in the Hudson Valley. There's the Franklin Roosevelt Museum over in High Park. There's the walkway over the Hudson there's a, a host of things to do. You, a week would might, might be a better stay in the Hudson Valley. Now you're talking. Yeah, your tourism board loves that. Yeah. All right. Well, Stu, as we uh, begin to wrap things up, is there anything that we haven't talked about or that I didn't ask you that you feel like is uh, something you want to mention before we head out of here? It's just, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to do this. I rarely need a reason to talk about my job in the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome. If folks are interested in making a contribution, go to the website. We're in the middle of an uh, an annual appeal. Our gala will be uh, on May 21st of this year. If folks would like to come by and support the museum 
or follow us on uh, Facebook. We have a very, very active uh, Facebook page, our YouTube channel. You can see a lot of what we do is uh, embedded on YouTube. And if they can't get here in person, they can enjoy it via the internet. That's for sure. Well, wonderful. Yeah. And that website again for you all is www.oldreinbeck.org. Yes. And then uh, you talked about Facebook, YouTube, and everything else. So, wow, Stu, thank you so much for uh, sharing all that uh, with us. I look forward to coming out and visiting. I love the website and the just incredible aircraft you all have in the inventory. We didn't get to talk about it. I should ask you about it now. The other things in the uh, collection, you've got old vehicles and trucks and and memorabilia and all that other kind of stuff that goes along with everything as well to fill in kind of the gaps. Anything special you want to highlight beyond uh, just the aircraft? Well, when I'm not administering the museum on my days off, I'm in the car shop. I enjoy wrenching on the Model Ts and the old cars, but I really, really have to give a shout out to our M1917 light tank. That is so popular with people. It's almost more popular than the aircraft. It's a operating M1917 Renault licensed design tank that is uh, fully operational, and it's one of the stars of the Sunday show. That recently went under a total restoration by our good friends Kurt Muller and Corey St. Pierre in the, in the car shop. It's a pretty rare bird. They do exist in the world today, but there's not a lot of them that are uh, actually running, which is our mantra here. We are known worldwide as a living museum, and the tank and the aircraft, of course, are prime examples of that. It recently, as I said, went under a full restoration, and I can tell you firsthand that working on a tank, even if it's a light tank from World War I, everything on it is heavy. The nuts are heavy. The bolts are heavy. The tracks are heavy. The track pins are heavy. My (laughs) wife could tell every day that I worked on the tank when I came home by the measure of the stoop in my back because uh, (laughs) I had a very, very small hand in the restoration of the tank, but it is extremely popular. We also have a very, very eclectic collection of uh, antique vehicles, just to name a few, a 1909 Renault touring car that is now made up into the uh, ferry of a uh, taxi cab, which had significance to the First World War. A 1911 Baker electric automobile also, which was recently the star of a Canadian television program on uh, electric vehicles. That is as recently restored. But the collection is about, I don't know, 25 to 30 antique automobiles as well. There's a lot to see here. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, that's so great. And yeah, again, for the listeners, www.oldreinbeck.org to uh, see the collection, sign up for uh, the biplane rides, all of the uh, other opportunities that you all have to offer. Check out their Facebook page, YouTube channel, everything else like that. And Stu, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was great to get to chat with you today. And we will uh, see you all next time. And hopefully we'll see you all this summer for uh, Terrific. one of the amazing air shows on the horizon. Well, thank you. And listen, if uh, any of your listeners uh, do make their way here, uh, you have my contact information. Let me know that you're coming. I'll give you the uh, premium tour. How's that? Hey, very good. Okay, very good, Trevor. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. My thanks again to Stu for covering all the great things that old Rhinebeck Aerodrome has to offer and helping to keep aviation history alive and in the air a really amazing organization that is doing some truly unique things. And with aerial demonstrations like those from the 1920s, it truly is a blast from the past. You know, like we discussed in the interview, the best way to really understand this era of aviation is by seeing it firsthand, as I intend to do. So please go check out www.oldreinbeck.org to support them, and even better, take a trip up there to see and experience all the great aircraft they have in person. Well, we're back once again for our, what is kind of a regular thing these days, our quarterly update with Mo over at Warbird Digest and Warbird's News. Mo, welcome back to the show. How you been? Pretty good. Thanks for having me, uh, Trevor. Great to hear from you. Uh, belated Happy New Year to you. Let's get right to it. What's been going on over at Warbird Digest and Warbird's News? Well, I think we, as often, we have great articles online on the magazine. We are working on wrapping up uh, issue uh, 95. 
and our subscribers uh, received issue 94, which has a beautiful World War I replica of Fokker fighters. That's a first for us. It's something that we never really had the opportunity to cover. We always focus on uh, World War II and, you know, Cold War Korean jets. But we actually, at least from since when we took over, the, I guess, the second chapter of the history of World War Digest since 2017, this is the first time we have a World War I aircraft. It's owned by Chris Hill and it's just looking beautiful. And uh, Chris Hill, what's interesting is trying to put together a down patrol rendezvous at the National um, Museum of the Air Force in October, where they will have four replica Fokker, all having original rotary engines. Oh, wow. Which is a really a cool thing. And this is a very overlooked segment of the World War community. We all look at World War II stuff, but the World War I guys are not as many, obviously, as the World War II restorers and operators, but it's very fascinating what they do. Different kind of aviation, different kind of machines, but still the same passion and dedication to preserving aviation, aviation history. Again, that's exciting, and that's really on the cover of World War Digest. So check it out on our Facebook pages or on worldwardigest.com. And yeah. as usual, we have other contents. We have actually a very cool, your listeners might like it, Days of Thunder. We have a... Uh, an article about the British uh, lightnings and the restorations that it's going on and down in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There is a group in South Africa that has, I believe, Thunder City, that's the name of the group, that has, I think, two lightnings and the organization went dormant for a while. And now we understand that there is a new wind behind and they're trying to get these lightnings up in the air again, a mammoth mammoth task if you think about it doing something like that oh yeah nowadays one airplane is enough let alone multiple for sure that's right we have a great article about the canadian t-33 red knight one about the caf p-51 gunfighter uh -huh. and that's really pretty much it we need to mention a couple of uh, events that happened a few days ago sure one is the passing of general charles mcgee yep Tuskegee airman and air force general uh, test pilot. He was 103 years old or 102 years old. Amazing. Yep. Great guy, classy guy, humble guy. He was really a phenomenal person to be around. I had the pleasure of meeting him several times because of my involvement with the CAF and some of the air show that I organize here in Atlanta. So really a phenomenal guy. He will be missed a lot as a person, obviously. Yes. A few days before, on the 13th, in California, there was a big celebration for Bud Anderson 100th birthday. That's right. A few friends were able to go. Uh, one of our, my good friends, Ray Fowler, flew uh, one of the P-51s, one of the old crows. There are two old crows, both owned by Jack Roush, flew it to California and told me that the event was great and uh, Bud looks great, is still in great shape. Hopefully, we'll be here to celebrate 10 more years of Bud Anderson. That's right. That was a very special event. Again, talking about classy and the humble and leaders, Bon Anderson is the quintessential definition. So, Absolutely. We really, as usual on Warbirds News, we put out a lot of news out all the time. Good news is that we are seeing a lot of air shows coming back on June 18th from the Warbird side of things. The Ray Fagan Memorial Air Show is set for June 18th up in uh, Minnesota. Oshkosh has announced uh, a lineup of performers for 2022. A lot of people are ready to get back in the saddle full time. I think 2022 will be the year where we are back yep. here in Atlanta on May 14th. We haven't announced it officially. We are going to have an air show at PDK. While I'm supporting the airport authority organizing the air show, and the theme will be a Navy Warbirds. We are expecting between 20 and 25 Navy Warbirds which is exciting. Oh, perfect. From the restoration side of things, for those who have been following Waterbirds News and the Beach City Baby restoration, the C-53 that was rescued in Ohio and being restored by Jason Capra and his organization, they had the first taxi trials back in December. Jason is telling me it's ready to go and we are expecting the first flight hopefully in the next month, month and a half, which is exciting. Another first is another Spitfire. Check the skies this time in Australia in mid-December. 
So it's great to see these activities still very much going. Yeah. Duxford in England had a fantastic event. I wish I could have gone. It's called Spitfire, the evolution of an icon at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford. I believe the event opened up on January the 7th and will be going on for two months. And essentially they collected not all the Spitfire models, but most of them, I think they had, it's my understanding, 12 or 13 different Spitfire models lined up. And it's my understanding for those who went and George Land, who covers the event for us in the UK, took amazing pictures and a great report. And it's really an exhibit worth visiting if you obviously live in England. That's why the British do it right. They just do it right. And another, uh, I think, interesting news is a Lockheed P-38 restoration project came on the market, essentially. It's handled by courtesy aircraft sales. It's a very interesting aircraft with very unique history. Again, you can go on Warbirds News and read all about it. You're going to throw your name in the hat to uh, purchase that bad boy? <laughs> yeah, let me play the Mega Millions tonight and then I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. A Supermarine Seafire, again, very rare aircraft, flew again after seven years in the UK. For those who don't know, the Seafire is the naval version of the Spitfire. Team Manos Company out of the UK conducted a restoration back in November. Well, Mo, as we're starting to wrap up, what's the best way to find Warbird Digest and Warbird's News? On uh, social media, any channel, any platform you want, look up Warbird Digest. Online, warbirddigest.com. That's where you get your magazine, your subscription to the magazine. If you want daily news and daily articles, go on warbirdsnews.com. Both contents is shared on social media under Warbird Digest. Fantastic. Well, hey, it's been great catching up, and we'll look forward to uh, hearing back from you here in a couple months. Thanks for coming back on. Thanks for having me, and uh, you guys keep up the great work. Well, as we transition to the wrap-up today, we've got our first themed month of the year coming at you in February. And if anyone was paying attention to the country of origin of the aircraft in our Facebook page cover photo, you may have already figured it out. But for those that didn't, we're talking all things fighters from the UK. That's right. UK month is right around the corner. So we'll see you all on February 5th for the next installment of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. But until then, get high, get fast, and do some good work. We'll see ya. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.